If you have your Bibles, be hunting Philippians chapter 2. I am uh, honored. I've been on the lectureship here for some 50 years in a row. And uh, that's kind of a scary responsibility. And I never, come on in, come on in. I want some people sitting at my feet. Anyway, my wife and I met and married here 59 years ago, and so Harding is indeed special. And it's they announced yesterday we have over 7,100 students. Amen. That that ought to get a standing ovation. 7,100 students. We had less than a thousand when we were here. Amen. Isn't that wonderful and good? And this school is is true to the book. But always this school also is interested in our heart. I think that of all our universities that Harding makes an appeal to a man, come on in here. I need some guys with beards. <laughs> I take offense to that. That's gonna say. That's gonna say. You can imagine seeing him. What Methuselah looked like right there. <laughs> yeah. I, the thing that the thing that makes me mad. I don't mind him having a beard. But he's got hair. <laughs> and a man with hair don't need to have to grow a beard. <laughs> You'll notice a lot of guys that what ain't got hair then tries to make up for it. Hey, if we anybody else comes in, we're going to take up two contributions here. Is that somebody trying to sneak up on us? Did I tell you to turn to Philippians chapter 2? This afternoon, having all of y'all here, and these young men, they can sit on the floor. These, these steps over here make a wonderful seat. And uh, y'all got paper and pens, and what really hurts a preacher's feelings and destroys his ego is you bring in a pencil and paper and don't take any notes. <laughs> I thought one person one time was really taking notes on me, and when it was over, they came up and gave me a sheet of paper, and they'd been drawing a picture. <laughs> so there you are. I, today, am so happy that this room is filled because that's why I came here, to See how my brotherhood's doing, how this school's doing, and to see what our young people are doing. And isn't this wonderful? I can. But I'm also thrilled today in the audience are two preachers that uh, have been buddies of mine for years and years, and one of them's dad and granddad <laughs> has been a part of my ministry. Isn't that wonderful, folks? Isn't that wonderful? And I am just uh, humbled and honored that they're here. Come on in. And some of you men, some of you men, give this lady a seat. There you go. Boy, don't they teach him right here at Harding. He jumped up. Yeah, I got a chair or two down here at the front. Some more comes in. That's a good chair right there. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. This is Paul. And, and we'll start in, in verse 6. 
Let's start in verse 5. How's that? that? That's cheating, isn't it? It's what I want anyway. Let this mind be in me. That's the way I read my Bible which was also in Christ Jesus. There's a little sneaky thing right there, but we think, well, Jesus is Jesus, and He is. He's God. He, he had things me and you don't have. Amen? But also He became like man in all respects. That is awesome. God emptied himself and took upon himself the nature of man. Not part of it, but all of it. <coughs> Let this mind be in you. Jesus had to develop his own mind. He, God didn't send down an automaton, and I don't know if that's the way to say that. But he, 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 God didn't take him in heaven and punch some buttons, and that's the way he would be on earth. Who, being in the form of God, he didn't lose his divinity by some outside source. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He didn't say, look, I've lost. I'm losing something. And, and in one sense he did, but in another sense, folks, he gained. He gained. God became man. He'd never done that before. And, and, and God made man. Jesus was right there. He was the creating force. The Bible says nothing of God was created except by Him. So Jesus is the creative force. And now what He has created, He now becomes a part of. Folks, this is amazing grace right here. But he made himself of no reputation. Folks, Jesus was born like a baby like any of you, and he had to have diapers and had to be cared for. He was as helpless as any other baby. That's hard for us to grasp, isn't it? God in a manger. And he took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Y'all need to underscore that in your Bible. Folks, we all know, me and you, we need to be humble. Amen? Amen. <laughs> What's the biggest need, preacher? Humility. You get people humble, baptism's no problem, folks. Hello? You get people humble, going to church ain't no problem. See, we try to circumvent all of this thing and, and get what we want out of them, folks, and then sometimes we hadn't done them a bit of good. Amen? You get a man humble, and then God can really make something out of that guy. And until then, he does not. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's interesting too, folks. It's one thing to die. All of us are going to die. But I don't think any of us would like to be crucified. The cemetery is in my pasture for my community. I've known that cemetery all my life. The only nice thing about it is <laughs> I have the main lot at the main gate and my parents and Helen's parents are there and will be there and everybody else will have to walk over us <laughs> <laughs> to be buried in our cemetery so they'll know we're there. <laughs> they'll know where we're there. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him 
and given him a name which is above every name. Jesus was God, folks, and I, I can't grasp this. This is beyond me. But because of the attitude and, and, and how Jesus came and served God Almighty and made it possible that me and you can go to heaven, God was pleased with it. Folks, if he had not, me and you wouldn't be here today. Amen? And if, if we were, we'd be wasting our time. It's a good verse right there. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Funny things fall out of my Bible, but I'll go get them. Our lesson this afternoon, we have studied this morning's civility. And y'all need to get that, folks. This is how we get along, and we're not very good at that. I had never heard a sermon on civility. Huh? We don't have any books on it. And then we had our second lesson on contentment. And, and, and this is something in the background of our minds that we want, but we really don't know what it is. And, and it doesn't have a priority. And so now our third lesson is humility. And even sinners, worldly folks, respect humility. I don't know of anybody, folks, that lacks pride, unless it's in himself. <laughs> Amen? We, we, uh, we, we, we don't like that. Proud men, folks, we want them shot down. I'm teaching on it this afternoon, but I've never been accused of. I've been a Christian now for, I've got to start figuring up, 68 years. I should be humble by now, folks. Amen? What's your excuse? <laughs> I usually say this jokingly, but there's a lot of truth in it. My first book was Humility and How I Attained It. <laughs> Y'all are slow, folks. You're slow. <laughs> it didn't sell very well. <laughs> I told the class this morning in announcing this afternoon, it's kind of... A problem. You have to be proud to preach on humility. You kind of, there's a little sneaking fish hook in there saying to everybody, you know, I, I, I got it. I, I, I'm on it. Amen? No man, I guess, besides Jesus, is qualified to teach on this. Somebody told me the story. A man in his uh, whatever was given the most humble button. But he wore it. And he ruined it. <laughs> Amen. It, it, it really, that's humility. It's, it's hard to get your hands on it. And we always kind of talk about it. But it's at a distance. We don't really get down and dig into it. I have written at least 25 books. I'm the back page writer for The Advocate, and I write for several other of our publications. But I've never been asked to speak on it. Never been asked to write on it. Ma'am, Count yourself. We want a big count here today. <laughs> She's here. 
Three things, starting with an H. You preachers, I like three-point sermons. This will preach. Be honest. Be humble. Be holy. Won't that preach? Isn't that what we're trying to do with everybody? Make them honest and humble and holy. And then I want you to do this. And I hope you change your mind about it in the next week. I want you right now to write down the name of the most humble person you know. That may be difficult. You'd have to stop. But after studying humility, will you change your mind about that person. Okay, some foundation. We don't have a clock in here, but when y'all start walking out, I'll know to quit. So, some foundational facts. Micah 6 and 8. This is in the old Bible, folks, but you can't beat this. Micah says to do justice. And I like this next statement. To love mercy. Not know it or teach it, but to love mercy. Do y'all love mercy? I think we as a brotherhood are scared of it. We're scared of being soft. We're, we're scared of being lenient. And I don't want us folks to, to sell out the truth. I, I didn't say compromise. I didn't say water anything down. I, I am telling you folks that, that there's two sides Two ditches on either side of the road. I want us to be in the road and out of the ditches. And so we'll fall into one ditch to keep from falling in the other. And that doesn't make you right. Foundational facts. Micah 6 and 8. Humility is the unique virtue of Christianity. Philosophers say a lot of good things. They're not interested in humility. Other religions, folks, good, bad, or indifferent, skip. Totally humility. If I were put on a pressure place and said, what's wrong with these other churches? It would simply be, they're not interested in humility. And that eliminated. Folks, any religion that does not result in humility is false. Only Christianity, religion, philosophy, science, you name it. And now our problem today, the more you understand humility, the more difficult it is. We have a, like I say, a, a little shabby thinking here. We haven't really gotten into the nuts of the coconut right there, folks, or the kernel, whatever that statement is. And and, and the more you delve and, and, and pry and try to be humble, and when you think you have it, you just lost it. You need to go back and start over. There is a vast difference in being humbled and being humble. Did y'all hear that? Well, somebody said, Whoa, I made a fool out of myself. Well, you probably did. And that can be an open door into humility. So take that. Amen. But being, making a fool out of yourself and humility are two different things.
You cannot be spiritual without being humble. That's been our mistake over the years. Humility, folks, is to God and not to man. We're trying to present a case to men. Repentance causes humility, not vice versa. I think we need to restudy that just a little bit. So what... Uh, Humility is not. Number one, it's not false pride. That's hypocrisy. It is a sin to run other people down. And hear me on this, folks. It is equally a sin to run yourself down. Well, brother, that's not amount to much. Well, I agree with you, but that's not the right attitude. That's not humility, folks. Humility is not thinking too much of yourself, is not thinking too little of yourself. Humility actually is just not thinking of yourself. You have kept yourself out of it. And that's a very difficult thing to do. I haven't heard it in years, and it's all right if I don't hear it the rest of my life. But it used to be at church when you walked out, the preacher would be told, well, you stepped on our toes today. Y'all preachers heard that. I haven't heard that in years. But when I did, I told them I failed. I said, I wasn't trying to step on your toes. I was trying to break your heart. <laughs> I shot a little low. <laughs> if all I did was cripple your feet. Would you turn to Matthew 6? I don't have time now today to go really into all of this in verses 16 through 19. But this is just downright funny. Folks, there's a lot of humor in the Bible. I, I think somebody counted and there's 21 jokes in the book of Luke. And uh, I, I know you'll read Luke now to try to find them. But there's a lot of funny things. Jesus, folks, had a sense of humor. In Matthew there, he said the Pharisees, and that was the biggest religious bunch in town, he twists their faces. I don't know about you. you know, I don't know how to twist my face, do you? <laughs> I can try to move my... my I'm, I'm so old and stiff now, I can't even... But there are some people can can really twist their faces around. And, and Jesus is, in other words, he says it's as phony as a $3 bill. These guys, they're trying to appear religious when they're not. And, and the amazing thing is they succeed. At the time of Christ, the Pharisee was supposedly the most devout religious guy in town. And Jesus says, you're a bunch of bald-faced hypocrites. And that's the Hodge translation, but it's, it's real accurate, folks. It is real accurate. Humility, uh, get me on this one. You've got to go think about this. Is not an humility emotion. It's not a feeling. It's not being defeated and down. Humility, folks, is just a removal of yourself out of the picture. We live in the United States and down at church. We call it the 11th command. Thou shalt not get caught. And uh, a lot of people try to so hide themselves even from brethren. 
Folks, we ought to be the most open with each other. Amen. We haven't done well at that. Paul said something in Acts 20 and 19 that scares me to death. He's talking about his attitude towards preaching, and I'm a preacher. And he said, I served you in all humility. This is an apostle for, this is my favorite, amen? Nobody like Paul. With all humility of mind. And then he said of tears, that's a heart. Paul said he had character and he was not interested in reputation. We're more interested in reputation. So we got to notice in what humility is not. Humiliation is not humility. Being embarrassed can be a blessing, but it can also be an enemy. Humiliation is before men. Humility is before God. Let's turn to 1 Peter 5, if I can find it here. I got my little Bible that I carry. And uh, as I told y'all yesterday, I can't see without my glasses, and I can't see with my glasses. And that's kind of bad, isn't it? In 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you subject one to another. That's real humility. And be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the other. Hear that word again. Humble yourselves, therefore... And here it is, I told you it's to God, before the mighty hand of God. The more you see God, folks, the more humility you'll get. I promise you that. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. What humility is not, it is not a comparison with other people. Well, Brother Hodge, I'm more humble than he is. Well, that might not mean anything. <laughs> that may not be anything to, to brag about. Let's read again this Bible. This Bible talks about humility a whole lot. Let's turn to James chapter 4, and, and we'll look at verses 6 through 10. If I can find it right there. Am I right about James right there? James, I guess. Here it is, 4, 6 through 10. I'm, he giveth more grace. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. I like this, folks. We can be more powerful than the devil. We can send him home packing. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Send him home running, folks. I used to play a lot of different ball. Now I play handball. And that's a great sport, folks, if you all really like to play a great game. But uh, winners and losers. In any sport, whether it's one or a team, when you're playing not to lose, you're going to. 
It's just one of those. Uh, that's why I tell people, you got to play to win to win. And that's true with our Christian growth, folks. And I want to give you this statement, and this is my experience. It is a hard thing to pray well. Are y'all good at praying? Hmm? If you think you are, I'd probably tell you you need to take another look. Amen? The more you pray, the more you sense how you need. God doesn't hear you because you pray well. <laughs> he hears you because you came to him and prayed to him. So what is humility? Number one, it's what I just simply call bald-faced honesty. It's not thinking too much. It's not thinking too little. It's reality. Pride and madness go together. Humility and sanctity go together. Humility, folks, is integrity. <coughs> integrity. I don't know who said this or I'd give him credit, but he said integrity is the ability to count others better than ourselves without feeling inferior. That's a good statement, folks. So humility is bold-faced honesty with the truth. Secondly, humility is great. And listen to this statement because it's not going to make sense till you get to all of it. The opposite of pride is not humility. And we think that. The opposite of pride, folks, is gratitude. Gratitude is the mother of your mouth. The more you see how God is good to you and forgives you, the more humble you will be. The way to get men on their feet is to put them on their knees. I still have to tell all of us we need to pray more. And the next statement is simple, but we have a problem with it. Accept your acceptance. Well, well but, 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 Brother Hodge, I, but, but, and you start, but, but, let people love you. Let people be good to you. Hello? Hello, this is hard. It's hard for me. We, well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I want to stay out here all by myself, folks. God said, Hodge, you can't go to heaven alone. You've got to be with a bunch of other people going to heaven. That's why Jesus Christ built and bought the church where we could all be a part of the body, not just a bunch of individuals. You'll never make it alone, folks. And I wish you'd go home and really chew on this one. Learn to be at the mercy of mercy. Folks, you can't earn mercy. 
You say, well, God, give me mercy. Okay, well, now I, I don't owe you anymore. I've gone to church seven Sundays in a row, amen, and I, I've given $2 a week and, and have mercy on me, a sinner. Y'all prayed that one lately. Folks, you'll be praying that till the day that you die if you're a faithful Christian. The third thing on what humility is, it comes out of repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 and 10 simply says, Godly sorrow working. You got to get that godly sorrow in you. And you repent and you'll be humble. I guarantee that. You see, a man that cannot repent cannot be humble. Just can't. The next statement about humility as to what it is, it is to God and not to man. Obviously in society we're courting men. It's already, it's going to be nine to two years before we have another big national election and we're already out gouging each other already and this is the way man does things and Folks, the bigger God is to us, the better we are to each other. We've got to grasp salvation by grace. The greater our concept of God, the greater concept of humility we have. I tell people they need to be strong enough to admit weakness and sin. Folks, people that can't repent are weak. They're not strong, they're weak. People that can stand before God and brethren and say, I am a sinner, that's a strong guy. And God is going to make him strong. And y'all can disagree with me, but you can be dead wrong sometimes. I think humility is the virtue of virtues. I think it's the mother of them all. And you're working on this and working on that. And I tell people, just get a bigger dosage of humility and get a little bit more humility. Humility with truth is the most powerful thing on earth. That's why a lot of profound speakers are terrible preachers. They foul up and quit pack up and go home. But you give me a God-fearing, honest, humble man, and it's all right to cry in the pulpit. And he stands up there humble before God. And folks, I don't care how much he stutters and stammers, you're going to listen. And when one of your brothers comes and says, hey, I got to talk to you, that's a good time to listen. What are you doing in your life that will last forever? You know, young people, you need to start thinking about that. I know you need to get out of school. You need to get a job. You need a profession. You need to find a church. I know all of that. But what are you doing that will last forever? 
That's why the church, folks, is the most important thing on earth. Blood bought, spirit filled, hell proof, heaven bound. The church. I want to give you three B's. And you'll think I have them out of line, and that's all right. But you'll learn better one of these days. The first B, belong. Did you hear me on that one? The first one. The first one, belong. Well, what's the second one? Believe. Well, now, whoa, Brother Hodges, uh, you had to believe to belong. No, you belong, and that caused you to believe. We hadn't thought about that. And then you behave. You all agree with that third one, I think. I want to go back to this. I, I love studying with people any way, shape, form, or fashion. But it hit me years ago, the greatest thing I could do is just to get people to come and worship with us. Or to run around them, with them and just be with them. And, and they decided, I want to belong. Whatever that guy's got, I want it. And folks, when he senses that, you can teach him. And faith comes by hearing. You don't have belief until he knows some things. Amen? And so you say, Hodge, what are you trying to do? I'm just trying to get people to assemble with us every Sunday. Let them come and sing. Let them hear our singing. Let us... Observed the Lord's Supper, and he said, wonder what in the world is that? And, and, and then here's all the brethren hugging each other, and there was an illness or a death or, or a need, and the brethren just all come together. And, and, you know, here he is. He ain't got that, folks. Folks, we don't sometimes know what we got when we have a great church. Do you all know that? And so I just told guys, just come, come down and worship with us. And after several weeks, if you don't like singing spiritual songs and you don't like Bible lessons and you don't want to be a part of the family of God, God bless you. I'll let you be, amen. I'll try to go get somebody else. But when that guy comes down, and folks, one of these days, it may be too late, but he's going to have a tragedy. He's going to have a need. And to whom can he call? And who would go? So you need to belong. You have to belong to the United States of America before you have the rights involved in being a citizen of the United States of America. Why do they come here? Because they want to belong. But to become an American citizen, you got to belong. And then you believe. And then you behave. I've tried to be like Jesus with this. He only had two things. He had a cross. And he had a towel. I have brought my towel to Harding many times. We are here to serve, folks. And we are here to give people Jesus Christ on a cross. I thank you for coming today.
and for being a great audience. And may God bless you.